You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Okay, guys, welcome back for another episode of the Choose FI radio podcast. Today, I have a story that I'm very excited to get a chance to do. We brought Gwen in from Fiery Millennials, and today we're going to really try to focus on, I guess, what you could call the millennial path to FI. If I were going to look at my own story and timeline, we're kind of, me and Brad, to a lesser degree, are kind of in this transitional generation where a lot of this technology was really coming to the forefront. I would say that right behind us, though, is the pure millennial generation that maybe grew up to some degree with iPads in their hands and had access to all this technology earlier and really knew blogs from from the very beginning. Blogs, to some degree, were just arriving when we were coming through the ranks. But at this point, for the millennial generation, blogs had been here for a while. They been developed and they had access to a lot of this information. Now, I would not say that our guest today, Gwen, is second generation fire because she did not have a parent mentoring her through this process. She had to figure it out, but she did have the benefit of seeing other people do it first. And that's why this story is really cool. What if you weren't really given any advantages in life except that you are willing to learn everything that you didn't know and then actually do it? Be willing to push yourself, stretch yourself, and actually take action no matter what it took and how far it took you outside of your comfort zone. What if you had access to all this information right at the right time where you could actually execute on these game plans knowing that your future 30-year-old self was going to get to benefit from all of this information? That's the power of the story that we're going to do today. And I have Brad as my co-host here with me today and also introducing to the Choose FI audience, Gwen from Fiery Millennials. Hi, Gwen. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, coincidentally, I am doing great also. Uh, so what did you think about my intro? Did I represent or misrepresent the advantages that you had growing up as a millennial firewalker? Uh, I don't know if I'd say that we had it you know, from the very beginning, because I distinctly remember the only form of really entertainment that I had was like a handheld Nintendo, you know, like a Game Boy. I wouldn't say, I would say that the internet started to take, started to like really pick up when I was in like middle school. Okay. So we're going to have to go find someone even younger than you to find (laughs) someone that's truly got it made. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I definitely remember like being kicked out of the house and be like, go play outside. Don't come back until it's dark, you know, type deal. That is truly the game that we had. Go play outside. My, uh, I didn't get a cell phone until I was 17. You are not the droids we are looking for. <laughs> well, guys, it's been fun. See you later. Bye. Seriously, what kind of millennial are you, Gwen? Well, we were poor and my parents didn't want to give me a phone, so I had to pay for it myself. So I had to wait until I could actually afford it. Brad, are you giving your kids phones? That is a, uh, a big topic of discussion in our house. Yeah, it seems like in my daughter's school, everybody gets these phones around like sixth or seventh grade. And oh. yeah which is frightening. And yeah, Laura and I are in deep discussions over that. So honestly, uh, I'm so glad that I didn't have a phone and like the internet was barely a thing. Like we had MySpace, but nobody was like cyber bullying each other yet. Like we just kept the bullying in school. (laughs) (laughs) Face to face bullying. (laughs) All right. (laughs) All right, Gwen. Well, let's, uh, let's dive into this. So what I find so fascinating about your blog and your story is just that with Brad and myself, to a large degree, we we kind of talk about the past in a, if only I had known then what I know now type mentality where in theory, we would love to go back and we would love to do the house hacking. We would love to do the dual enrollment. But I think both of us know that at this point in our life, it's an academic exercise. It's a thought experiment. It's not something that personally, it's not a lever that either of us are going to get a chance to pull at this point in our life. But what I love about your story and and the choices that you actually made is I've seen across the board, you just actually do these things. You check the boxes. So if there's like a a milestones of FI, I'm very excited to see you hit yours. But along the way, there's got to be these checkpoints of FI and you're racking up a high score. I'm doing pretty good, I'd say. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us a little bit just about yourself, a a little bit about your family. It's going to start with the cell phone that you didn't get until you're 18, but kind of walk us through 
maybe those first couple of years and how you discovered the the Fi community and what that transition was like going from someone that's reading a blog, the blog you started with, and then how you decided to actually start doing some of these things. Did you just fall into it or was there a very intentional thought process there? So I guess it starts in high school is really where it started or even I guess before that because my parents made me save a whole bunch of my money. I worked with my mom over the summers cleaning people's houses and she would make me deposit half of her half my check into my bank account. So I got used to saving part of my money and then I had to get a job if I wanted spending cash. I had to, you know, like babysit or stuff. So I had to work for my money. My parents just didn't give it to me. And then they told me that I was expected to go to college after I graduated, but they they would only pay for two years of community college. Well, I didn't want to live with them for two more years and go to community college, even if it was free. So then I had to figure out, well, how do I pay for four years of college myself? And we had this conversation pretty early in high school. So I had plenty of of runway to do it. And it turned into a whole bunch of extracurriculars. There was times that I was at school from 545 in the morning for swim practice all the way through eight o'clock at night to Girl Scouts straight. I didn't go home. So I worked my butt off in high school and I took a bunch of dual credit courses through the local community college. So I got high school credit and college credit at the same time. So I actually graduated high school with 23 credit hours worth of college credit. So I entered school as a second semester freshman that shaved one semester off completely. And my parents paid for it because I was going to high school. So just to stop you there, because we do focus a lot on college hacking and the dual enrollment that you mentioned, like talk us through the thought process. Like, did you do a lot of research? Did you look into scholarships? Like, how did you figure out also that those dual enrollment would count at X, Y, and Z college that you plan to attend? Like, I guess just talk me through what you were thinking and what research you did that could potentially help our audience. So I've always had friends that have been a year or two older than me. And some of them went to this college. And so I visited them at college while I was in high school and said, wow, this place is really awesome. I want to go here. And at the time, it had a very good program for my major that I wanted to have, which I ended up changing. So I went to the guidance office and got the book for the college and all their classes and went online and looked up. In the state that I grew up in, there's a program that colleges and high schools and community colleges all work together and created this like this program where it standardized some of the classes and the requirements. So then I was able to look and pick out which classes were available at my high school that would directly transfer to my university and count as credits. So the only classes that I took in high school that were dual credit were ones that would transfer over. Yeah, and I think that's the important part that you go forward first and you find out which ones will actually carry value at the institution at which you want to end up. And then you work your way backwards to actually go to the classes. You don't just start with uh, the classes you want to take. You have to start with where you're going to end up. Otherwise, it's just a waste of your time, right? Yep. And yeah, I would advise the audience certainly to check the rules in your state and see what programs exist. I know Jonathan and I both live in the state of Virginia And there is a guaranteed transfer admission program that the Virginia community colleges have with the Virginia State Universities. So that includes up to the College of William and Mary and the University of Virginia, which are two of the top 50 schools in the country. And you as long as you check the boxes, you need to do a whole bunch of things, not least of which get a a certain GPA. But as long as you dot the I's, cross the T's, do everything right, you are guaranteed a transfer admission into UVA, which is really pretty remarkable. So and not to mention that you got two years at a community college for a fraction of the cost of what somebody else would have paid to have their freshman and sophomore year at UVA. So many of these programs exist throughout the country. Gwen is suggesting in her state. I know in our state, I I suspect in many, many other states as well. So do some Googling and see what exists in your state. But Gwen, I know that you capitalized on your college experience way more than just getting ahead by one semester. I mean, you're saying you got 23 credits of dual enrollment. That That's basically you're now one semester ahead of your peers, but you optimized in several other ways your college experience. Am I right about that? Yep. I didn't stop there. So I knew that that would 
knock one semester off, but then I still had to pay for seven more semesters. So I didn't want any debt. So I had to figure out, well, how do you go to college without any debt? And you see the advertisements all over the place. Join the military and we'll pay for your school. So I said, well, there's an easy way to do that. I mean, easy being a manner of speaking because it definitely wasn't that easy. But yeah, so after I graduated high school, I joined the Air Force in the Air National Guard. And uh, I had to wait a year, but they would have paid for all my school, except for the fact that then I got a scholarship for academics. So my university actually paid for every bit of my schooling. The only thing I had to pay for was fees and books. Are there any actionable takeaways on how you went about getting that scholarship? Is there anything that someone else could benefit from? Is it have a 4.3 GPA? I mean, are there any kind of secret life hacks that you can convey to our audience there? I mean, I was pretty average across the board. I mean, average, you know, being a manner of speaking, but I had a 3.5 GPA and a 28 overall on my ACT. So it wasn't anything, you know, incredible. I didn't get 36s or, you know, whatever the top SAT score is, but I did have a crap ton of extracurriculars. I was on a bunch of sports teams. I volunteered. I got my gold award through the Girl Scouts. So all of those together add up to be pretty impressive. Like, wow, she was able to maintain that kind of GPA while doing all this stuff on top of that. Like, was there a certain type of scholarship that you got? Like, where did you apply for the scholarship? Or how did you get it, basically? So the the university had a scholarship form that you filled out and then they would put you in every scholarship that you were eligible for. So I filled out one form. Uh, I didn't even write an essay to do this. I just filled out a form with all of my details and then they put me in all the ones that I was eligible for. Originally, I didn't actually get the full ride. I got a one year room and board waiver and an extra $1,500, but that was it. And then I got lucky, incredibly lucky, because somebody turned their full ride down and I was first on the waiting list. The one thing that's missing here is people just don't even fill out the application. I'm sitting here thinking to get a full ride, you need to fill out 30 or 40 different scholarships. You need to be working on it all summer. You need to write essays. You filled out one application. It was a generic application through the school. And that essentially, I mean, you know, call it luck, but you did put the application and it was one application. That sounds like a pretty good investment of time. Yeah. And I did everything with the goal of, I I knew what the requirements were. So I didn't let my GPA drop below 3.5. And I took the ACT through our high school for free for the first time. And the minimum requirements for getting the full ride was a 28. So I got my 28 and that was it. I was done. A lot of people I knew took the ACT two, three, four times to get the score that they wanted, but I saw no reason to take it over again and pay money for it when I got what I needed the first time around. So you've got a full ride for school now, but you've also got this Air Force scholarship repayment. I mean, how does all that end up going together? Do you end up with extra money? So what happened was the first year, the school paid for all of my schooling and all of my tuition. And then I missed a semester due to going through basic and tech school. So the military and the school wouldn't let me double dip. So technically, I still have eight semesters of college that I could go use at a state school in that state. But I don't I don't think I'll use it just because I don't want to go back to school for anything right now. And, and to clarify, the reason you still have eight semesters of eligibility left is because you have this credit for from the Air National Guard. You, Correct. You did not end up needing to use it. So you've got, so while a lot of people are struggling to get one full ride, you essentially got twice what you ended up needing. And it wasn't because you were this incredibly gifted student that had a 4.0 GPA and was able to write tons and tons of essays and nailed all these different metrics. You just looked and you saw what the rules were and you just did the minimum that you needed to do in order to qualify for those things. And because of that, you could have done this thing twice while other people are complaining or operating from a set of limiting beliefs that there's no way to get college for free. Yeah. So I didn't have this this university scholarship first. So then I went into the military, which was guaranteed. And then I got my scholarship. So I had a backup plan in case uh, my, I sh- my college GPA should dip below what it needed to be. I had to keep a 3.5 in college as well. Okay. That reminds me of Jonathan's famous quote, the backup plan for your backup plan. And Did it, yeah, I love that one. I was biting my tongue, man. I was totally <laughs> biting my tongue on that one. So Gwen, I just want to clarify, there's two points that come to mind. The first one is this Air Force National Guard. Is this something that this is a life hack that everybody should be considering, especially if they don't have an obvious way to pay for college. 
I would say it's kind of more involved than that because you have to be eligible to be in the military, right? There's a bunch of people that would be ineligible. You have to qualify for military service. And some people have uh, existing health issues that would disbar them from being in the military. Would you say it was a net positive experience? Would you go that route again if you hadn't gotten the full scholarship ride? Absolutely. Yeah, I learned a lot about myself and a lot about how other people operate and how the world works. And um, and they they paid me f- to go to school. So it was totally worth it for me. And then the other half of that is my brother did ROTC. He did the core. Would you group those together or are those two distinct different approaches that will get you to a similar result? They're two separate approaches. Although ironically enough, I also did ROTC my freshman year, but it was army ROTC. So I was out. Of course you did. You wouldn't limit yourself <laughs> to just doing it one way. Why do one way? We can do all three. <laughs> It was fun. All right. So you've crushed this college game. I think there's probably a lot to draw from. I think there are people that are trying to figure out how to do college. And and these some of these things are things that maybe they, in theory, know are out there, but they may not know anybody that's actually has done this stuff. I think that's one of the biggest things is finding a role model or an example, somebody that you can go to with these questions. So I love that you're in our space and you've actually done some of these things. It makes it great because I have had people asking me questions along this train of thought, and and I'd love to just be able to send them to you so you can kind of mentor them maybe to some degree through this process. But the second half of this is you've made these choices, but this is almost accidentally FI. Did you know about FI at this point? I did not. Okay. Tell us, how did you find FI? So there I was sitting in my dorm room and I was just messing around on the internet. I think I was actually on StumbleUpon, if you remember that website. And I stumbled across Mr. Money Mustache's site and I was reading and I said, oh my gosh, this is what I can work towards. This is what I've been preparing for and I didn't even know it. So it was like the light bulb went off, something crystallized, you had the awakening, everything changed. That was it. Ding, light bulb. Yep, definitely. And Gwen, were there any particular articles that you remember that jumped out to you? Or I mean, did you go down the rabbit hole and read everything he put out? Oh, I went down the rabbit hole. I read everything. I listened to his um, like his YouTube videos that he had out. Stop. He has YouTube videos? How did I not okay, know no, this? So, so he has like videos where he's been and things like there was the one where he was talking. Basically, when he goes to to conferences and presents those are on youtube i need to see this yeah we will definitely link that up in the show notes if there's the one where he talks about uh how to how to make a cult (laughs) he's gonna tyler durden it oh yeah totally that's perfect all right so walk us through it does your life change i mean it sounds like you're doing so many things right what's different about gwen where the light bulb's gone off versus the grazing gwen how does that how does life change it did and it didn't um it gave me a reason to do the things that I was doing and help me keep my lifestyle in check. Here I am, I'm getting $900 a month to go to school and I have zero expenses basically. I have car insurance and I have gas and my cell phone bill and that's it. So I had a lot of extra money laying around and this helped me be conscious of my consumerism and consume less and save more. And it gave me a reason to do so instead of being just like, eh, no, I, just, I don't want to go spend money. It's like, sorry, I can't spend money because I'm saving. Consume less, save more. I think I think we can go on break, Brad. <laughs> yeah, that's, that about covers it. I like that, Gwen. Hey, Gwen, <laughs> when, you, uh, when you graduated, I'm not sure what year, you didn't say specifically what year you found Mr. Money Mustache on StumbleUpon, but when you graduated, how much were you able to save? Do you remember? I had $10,000 saved up by the time I got out of college. Wow. Right. So Plus no student loans, card. obviously, a backup plan for your backup plan, and you had $10,000 saved up. Yep. So first of all, we have kind of stated in the past that your financial freedom clock starts when you get to zero. And for most of first generation Phi, we're starting from a hole that we dug ourselves, usually because we did not take some of these more creative outlets to get our student loans taken care of. We had to pay those down. And at some point after we got out of school, then our financial freedom clock started. But yours actually started right around your sophomore or junior year of college. Correct. That's pretty cool. So you know, the next thing that comes to my mind, if I were thinking about what this optimized millennial path would look like, I would think you're, you're going to get out and you're going to start looking for your first job. But what I have come to realize, especially looking back and, and trying to assess because you don't know what you don't know, looking back, I realized that it's not good enough to graduate school 
and start looking for a job from scratch. The, the key that I have found over and over again from listening to other people tell me about it is this concept of internships. And I just have this sneaky suspicion that you didn't wait to graduate to kick that strategy into gear. Did you pursue any internships? Was that something that was on your radar? I did. Yes. I wasted one summer because I started looking in the spring. That's when you think that internships would be looking, right? Is right before the summer. But most employers actually start looking for and hire interns in the fall before that next summer for internships. So go to the job fairs, start looking at companies hiring boards if they don't come to your if they don't come to your university because I messed that up and I wasted a whole summer where I could have been working. So I'm going to try to learn from your mistakes and trust me when I say your mistakes would have been my successes or if I said that right. Basically though, you, you were doing everything right, but I'm sure there's still a way to improve on it. That's what I'm trying to get across. And it sounds to me like you're saying the first year you messed up because you started looking in the spring trying to get the summer internship, but hindsight being 2020, you needed to kick it back to the previous fall. And then there's a couple keys to this. You go to the job fairs when they're available, and then you go to the hiring boards. I'm particularly interested in the hiring boards. What do you mean by that? Is that something that your school hosts or is that going to the employer's websites? What does hiring boards actually look like for you? So sometimes uh, when you get close enough to graduating, the university will actually send out job notifications. They say, hey, this company reached out to me and they've got a couple entry job, entry level jobs open. Send in applications if you're interested. And then otherwise you have to go out to these companies and look on their on their websites and see if they have any part-time student or internships available. Did you have more success with these essentially online applications or with meet and greets, FaceTime, job fairs? Uh, Meet and greet in the job fairs. I had kind of slacked off and I say slacked off, but really I just didn't do as much as I did in high school. So I didn't have the overly impressive resume in college, although it was still pretty impressive, if I do say so myself. But no, I come off really well in person. So I went to the job fair and talked to a whole bunch of companies and received a lot of interest, handed over my resume and my phone number and everything. And and then I set up interviews and I got two interviews that were really exciting to me, both really big companies, top 100 companies. And so the one never got back to me, which I was super bummed about because it was my hometown company that I was pretty much looking forward to working for until they just completely dropped the ball. And then this other company, they called me the next day, set up an interview. And then uh, the next day I went to the interview. They scheduled another interview a week later at their company. So I drove up there had the interview and then came back and another week went by and I had an internship offer. So they were like, wham, bam on it. And the other company was like, "Ah." (laughs) Hey Gwen, so I'm curious for college sophomores or juniors out there, you're talking these two distinct paths, right? The job fair and the job boards. Did you notice any distinction between the type of companies that might have shown up to a fair versus appeared on these boards? Like I'm not all that familiar with them, honestly, but like we're always looking for actionable tips for the audience. Like, were there any differences? Were there differences in companies? Were there differences in method of approaching them? These kind of things. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, uh, it definitely is different. So the companies that were coming, I went to a fairly small state university. So it was whatever companies were in the area. If you wanted to be local, then that was definitely a good way to go. If you wanted to apply for some of the more name brand companies, maybe in different areas of the country, then the job boards would be the way to go. But they're also just an application and they can winnow you out via the power of the internet, right? Who knows if somebody would actually see that resume. So it was more of a gamble if you went the just applying for an interview via job board. Now, the other half of this is like, Tell us your secrets. Like you said, I I feel really good about meeting people in person. Is there anything that we can extract from Gwen? Any little life hacks here that allows the person that's going to try and do these meet and greets in person to stand out from the crowd? Is there anything that you feel like you did a really good job at that maybe someone that's listening to this and trying to figure it out, how can I stand out? from that person, that that line of people that's going up and just shaking hands. How, how do you stand out without just glad handing? Well, you need to be presentable for one. Wear business formal clothing. So that means business jacket, um, guys wear tie and look really professional. And they're like, wow, 
she looks really professional. I think she'd fit in well with us. And then you have to be personable. Just go up and talk to them like you've known them forever. And they're going to be relaxed and talk to you. And, and you'll make an impression because you're not be like, um, um, hi, my name, my name is Gwen. You're like, hey, my name is Gwen. How are you? Nice to meet you. Yeah, you know, I'm looking for an internship this summer. So, you know, here's my resume. And ask some questions about the company. If you don't know any, step outside and Google them on your phone. And like ask them what they're looking for because you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Yeah. So help me out, Gwen. So you're graduating. How old are you at this point? Give us a timeline here. So I did an internship uh, in the summer of 2013. And then two weeks after I went back to school for my last semester, they called me and said, hey, we've got a full-time position after you're done. Do you want to come back? And I said, absolutely. Thank you very much. I'd love to come back. And so I had a full-time job offer two weeks into my final semester as a senior. So that was pretty awesome because I just took it way easy. You know, all I had to do was graduate and have to worry about grades or anything. So I had some fun. And then I graduated and took two weeks off for Christmas and New Year's and then went to work starting in January 2014 at the age of uh, 23. So you're 23 years old. You've graduated college. You've done what a lot of us never considered and did get the full ride, got the full ride two different ways, did the internship programs. You've come out, you've got your job. You have a $10,000 net worth at this point, and you're starting way, way ahead of most of us, of, of what we would have even have considered possible. And I think that there's nothing that I've heard so far that isn't something that anybody that's in our community, second generation, FI, uh, someone that's hearing this stuff while they're in high school, you certainly don't need to be given a silver spoon in order to get these sorts of results, right? Absolutely. Okay. So I think that's cool, Brad. I mean, just as an aside, I think that when you know that other people are doing it and you're willing to not do what our culture tells you to do, which is to take out as much as you need in student loans, because you're going to get a job and you can pay it back over 25 years. When you decide that, no, that is not acceptable. I need to find other people and see what they have done. This is what I would want for my second generation Phi. I would coach them more towards this path. Are you on the same page? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think Gwen hit this on the head in every way possible, right? She looked at the problem a little bit differently. How can I get a scholar? How can I get a backup for that scholarship? That in and of itself is impressive. And then she's coming out of college with a positive net worth. I mean, that is just really, truly remarkable. The cool thing is like we have said over and over again that if you just do a few things right at the beginning, you don't need to make nearly as many right choices later on because you now have all this time. So I remember talking to several people and and who I would call first generation fire. But in particular, I'm thinking about Jay from Slowly Sipping Coffee, a millionaire educator. And we kind of had this thing in common that we lost that decade of our 20s because we spent that entire decade trying to pay down this debt. But if you can lock down your teens and your 20s, the bar is lowered in terms of what you need to achieve in order to hit your FI number either earlier or later. I mean, just everything gets easier when you can make those choices, the right choices early on. All right, Gwen. So we're in the beginning of 2014 now. You're 23 years old. You have a full-time job. You have a positive net worth. Where do you go from here? We're talking now three and a half years later. Tell us about your journey from the beginning of your job to now. I'd love to hear the highlights. So I went into uh, what's called an early development program. And it was two 18-month rotations to kind of um, experience different aspects of the company and figure out where in IT I wanted to go. So I started off as a Linux system admin and figured out pretty quickly that I didn't want to be a Linux admin for my career. And so while I was doing that, I was busy starting to max out my retirement accounts. I got a house. It was a beautiful three bedroom, like 1500 square foot house. And it was actually pretty funny because at the beginning I was like, oh, you know, it's kind of small, but it'll do until I can get a bigger place. And then after living there for a couple months, I realized, why do I need a bigger place? I can't fill this place by myself. It's way too big. And so then I got a roommate. And so my roommate paid half the rent. So my expenses were pretty low still. I didn't have a car payment. I was paying, you know, typical utilities, gas, insurance, and $450 in rent a month. So I kept my expenses as low as I possibly could. Not as low as they were in college, but pretty darn low. So you're in this early development program and you're drawing a salary at this point, right? Yes. Okay. And then what I heard you say is that at this point, your first year in, you were, you went ahead and started maxing out all of your investment vehicles that they offered. Uh, Not all of them, but I tried. So I actually made a mistake and I calculated the match in 
the contribution limit. So at the end of the year, I had exactly the amount, $18,000 in there, but I'd only put in 13. So I could have put in way more. I just didn't realize it. So you were thinking whatever they matched, once that hits 18, I can't go over that. Yep. Okay. I can understand you make the mistake. I think there's probably something we should actually talk about as an aside, but you did not realize that you could actually put in up to 18 yourself. Right. Okay. Yeah. I didn't separate it out. I just lumped it all together. But I'm assuming that the reason that you made the choice so aggressively to start maxing that out is because you at this point had been exposed to the Mr. Money Mustache articles and specifically the shockingly simple math of early retirement. Yes, that. And I went down the mad scientist rabbit hole and basically read every single blog I could possibly get my hands on. So I'm drawing from everybody in the FI world, not just Mr. Money Mustache. I want to pause on this because it goes back to this idea that starting early, if you start early, you understand the stuff at a young age, you don't need to do as much to get to five because time is now working for you. So to our audience, I just want you to pause on this. She's 23 years old. She's learned the power of the math. And at this point, she is doing her best to max out these buckets because she realizes how powerful this is. So as she's able, she's prioritizing $18,000 a year and putting it into these pre-tax buckets. And her employer is giving her some match that's not really being accounted for in that number on top of that. So it's even really more than that. And I, I guess I'm thinking, well, because you got this so early, let's go with our normal thing. We talk about people working for 10 to 20 years, somewhere in that, that range. Let's say that Gwen works until she's 35 years old, but because she grabbed it and started at such a young age, she's maxing out her vehicles each year. That means that she'd be putting the equivalent of $1,500 a month into this tax advantage vehicle, this 401k. Brad, can you run the... the the numbers for us and find out what that would be? What would it look like to throw $1,500 a month into a 401k from the age of 23 to 35? All right. Yeah. I just plugged this in while you're talking and uh, with an 8% annual return, which is kind of our, our average that we use just as a, a general rule here, the amount looks to be $369,000. So Gwen will have yeah $369,000 at 35 if she gets that 8% return, which is really truly remarkable. So I'm 32 years old right now. And so I'll be 35 years old in just a couple of years. And I can't imagine, I wish I could imagine what it would be like just to make those few choices during my twenties and be landing basically where I am now with a net worth of $325,000, never having made a six figure income. Yeah, that would be amazing. I mean, personally, I didn't max out my 401k when I got right out of college. So Gwen, yeah, really, really well done on that. I want to come back to this point and I want to introduce a new concept that we haven't really talked about up to this point, but it was introduced to me by one of our readers. So, And they wanted to present this idea and they actually wanted this to be a milestone or for it to be a, a checkpoint, certainly. And it's called the cruise control checkpoint. And it is the point at which, because you've gotten this amount of money set aside, you don't need to contribute another dollar and your 60 year old future is totally set. So what I went ahead and just did is I took the $365,000 that she had set aside at the age 35. And I said that, let's say that Gwen somehow abandons this, this life of intentionality and she just spends every dollar that comes in the door, but she doesn't go into debt, but she spends every dollar that comes into the door from the age of 35 to 60, but she leaves those pre-tax dollars alone. Do you know how much money she would have at the age of 60 waiting for her? I can only imagine it's going to be millions, but uh, do tell. It is literally, quite literally, $2.5 million. Wow, that's so awesome. <laughs> that's what you call cruise control, my friends, and lock that one down because if you make just a few right choices in your 20s, your 60-year-old future is set. You can spend every, and I'm not telling you to do this, but realize the power. You can spend every single dollar that you earn from the age of 35 to to 60, but because of the choices that you made for the first 12 to 13 years, you are going to be worth $2.5 million at the age of 60. Gwen, did I just blow your mind? Consider my mind blown. <laughs> I love math. Well, let's go back to some of the core details here. Your future self is worth 2.5 million, but current Gwen is not worth 2.5 million. She's just making the small little decisions that really optimize your future strategy. And going back to what you're actually doing now. So you're 23, you're 24 years old, you're renting your first place and you're paying, I think 900, around $900 a month is what I see on your blog is what you're paying in rent. And I believe even at that point, you were already thinking roommate, right? Yep. I got a roommate uh, towards the end there. So for about eight or nine months, I had a roommate helping me split the bills. Okay. And so if they're splitting it, your, your cost for your home at this point is $450 a month plus utilities. Plus utilities. Yep. So it ended up being about $700 a month to live in this three bedroom place. 
So there's nothing extreme there, but I do believe at this point, people were starting to talk more and more about this idea of house hacking. And one of the reasons I wanted to go here is I know that you latched onto this concept as well, right? Yes. Why don't you go and tell us a little bit about your house hacking experience? Uh, Okay. So I went to the Chautauqua in 2015 and Paula Pant was there from Afford Anything. And she talked to me and a couple other people had really positive things to say about real estate. And then uh, I came back and I was on fire. You know, I was like, oh, real estate. Yeah, that could be a totally awesome way to build this income on the side. So it took me a while to actually find a property that I wanted. I tried to find a property and the market was red hot. I didn't really have that great of offerings. So I didn't get a place until two years later this spring is when I finally got my first house to hack. So it's 2017. I guess you purchased your your home and, and we're going to definitely talk about that because I know you have some interesting stories in that. But did you rent for ultimately three years and have a roommate for all that time? I rented for three years. I had a roommate for approximately nine months of those three years. I moved to a different city for my second rotation and kind of splurged and got a two bedroom apartment that I kept for myself. So it was a little bit more expensive than my last one, but I was only a mile and a half from work. So I was able to cut some costs there. So what was the decision behind getting a bigger place? So I went from a three bedroom, 1500 square foot house for $900 to a two bedroom, 1100 square foot apartment for $1,100 a month. So I, I did downsize, but it cost me more because I was in a fancy part of town since I wanted to live so close to work. Okay. So that was the main drive was was living close to work and did you did you walk did you bike ride there or did or what did you how did you get to work living that I would like to say that I was hardcore and I rode my bike and I walked to work all the time but that's a lie I usually drove but if it was a super nice day out I rode my bike you know I think you have a friendly audience here with Brad and myself as neither of us uh, are known for our biking skills but certainly you know time matters so drive bike walk whatever it is but just the fact that you have that short commute I think there's a real value to that just recapturing that time you know I often see people that drive like 40 minutes to an hour each way to work and you've automatically obtained for yourself a 10 hour a day job minimum. And sure, you can listen to your Choose FI podcast on the way and on the way back. And that's a great choice. But man, that's a lot of time to spend at work and in the car commuting. I used to complain because my car wouldn't warm up by the time I got to work. So it was really cold driving to work still. First world problems for sure. (laughs) Yes. What a tragedy. You know, just as an aside, it's interesting to me that Brad and I, over the last six months and over the last year, to some degree, we've kind of been following this progression of yours. And something that I know that we've commented on to each other uh, is just that we'll see a blogger somewhere do something very interesting, make this unconventional choice. And then shortly thereafter, we'll see, we'll see Fiery Millennial, you know, we'll see Gwen go ahead and tackle this object. And it's something that maybe both of us were to some degree intimidated by. And you just go ahead and you just do it. Uh, And it's, it's very inspiring. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is just because I know that you have actually tackled house hacking. And to me, that is just this really cool adventure that's got to stretch you. And I'm just I'm incredibly curious about how you landed on this idea and also just what your experience has been. Well, I saw everybody else doing it, so I decided to do it too. Um, <laughs> lemmings. So, uh, <laughs> so I talked to a bunch of bloggers and people that were house hacking or had rentals and said, well, you know, I can do that too. So I went out and I bought a property uh, for $85,000. I got a 2,300 square foot triplex uh, and it's a beautiful historic house. And uh, I live in a studio, so I've definitely made some sacrifices and downsizing, but they pay me to, my tenants pay me to live in this house. So my housing costs are literally net positive every month instead of net negative like everybody else is. So $80,000 is what the the total thing cost you. I mean, you obviously didn't pay for, I don't believe you paid for that cash. So it means you put a down payment on it. Is that $8,000 down? Um, roughly thereabouts. Uh, I had a VA loan, so I didn't have to put down the full 20%. I also have no PMI. So you you have $8,000 invested in it and your mortgage payment. How much is your mortgage payment on that? My mortgage payment is $705 every month. And your tenants, are they covering just the 705 or is there extra on top of that left over? There's extra left over. My one is a one bedroom and that goes for $500. And the other one's a two bedroom that goes for $600. So that's $1,100 in rent I get to pay $705 in my mortgage. 
every month. Just on the face, what a win. I mean, you went from before with the past scenario, you were paying $1,100 a month and $900 a month respectively for the other two places. Now, are they paying their utilities as well? Uh, they pay some of the utilities, but uh, the ones that I pay for are heat and water. So after utilities, it maybe cost me 50 bucks a month if it's cold outside. All right. Well, I mean, obviously you're a landlord, so you are responsible for, for maintenance, but in general, it sounds like you have some cushion there with your numbers. Yeah, definitely. And I didn't spend all my money on the down payment. I could have put down a bigger down payment, but um, I knew this house needed a bit of work. So I decided to put down less money on the down payment and save some for all the work that needed to be done, which as I have gone through this has been quite a bit more than I expected. One thing I really want to focus on there is aside from the fact that you're actually bringing some amount of money in. So you may be, even after you do your maintenance, you may, you may be making a little bit of profit. The biggest win there is that your expenses have now been decreased by almost a thousand dollars a month because you don't have to pay to live somewhere. Your, your housing costs are just gone. Yeah, it's been a real lifesaver to my budget. Which then allows you to focus that on your savings rate. I mean, ultimately what we talk about is savings rate. Okay. I am curious, like, can you walk us through this process? Like maybe the journey, the progression of your savings rate, where was your low and what was your high? Have you tracked that, that range to any degree? I don't have the the actual amounts right in front of me, but it historically averages about 45% a month. All right. And do you make, si- and do you make six figures? No, I earn, uh, so I started out at like $66,000 and now I earn $77,000. So you're, you're hitting just shy of a 50% savings rate. And the reason that you're able to do that is that one of the things that's allowing you to do that is you've totally crushed your housing expenses, which gives you a huge leg up. And then you're maxing out all of your tax deferred vehicles, which has allowed you to get all the way up to like a 45% savings rate. Tell us a little bit more about this house hack, the pros, the cons. Tell us a little bit more about the experience overall. Well, I mean, I'm gaining equity every month. So you have to count that into the, uh, the math as well. So they're not only paying me to live here, but I get to keep part of that money that they're paying me in the form of house equity. I may have moved a little fast. This is the second property that I looked at and I ended up buying it. So I, I thought I knew what I wanted and it's worked out okay so far, but I could have probably scouted out the area a bit better. I didn't think that it was as bad as it might be. It's definitely okay, but um, people's reactions when I tell them where I live in town are like, ooh, you live there? Like, isn't that a bad area? It's not that bad. It, it could be a lot better for sure. So Gwen, what kind of research did you do before you purchased this property? Like, you know, how well did you know the area? How, and you said you bought the second property. Like, was it that it's such a hot housing market that you were worried about losing it? You mentioned Paula Pant before. Like, you know, she talks about like her 1% rule. Like, did it fit? the initial requirements that you were looking for and therefore, okay, I checked all the boxes. I'm going to put an offer on this or like talk us through the decision making of why you ultimately purchased the second place that you looked at. So after I finished my second rotation in the program, I got a full time job and moved back to the first town that I lived in for the first rotation. So I knew the area fairly well already. And I took a couple of months to familiarize myself with the area again. And I actually lived in my friend's basement for $400 a month. So I'm looking at all these places. I'm keeping an eye on what's going on the market. I know what I'm looking for. I told my realtor, I'm not even looking at the property if it doesn't meet the 1% rule. And he owns several rental properties. So he knew exactly what I was talking about. And we were able to winnow down the available market into only the ones that were going to work for me. So then this one was just a really good deal and I couldn't pass it up. Also, I got a little bit emotional and I fell in love with the house. So I really wanted it. So that might have clouded my judgment a little too. Let me ask you this. If you had been able to keep your emotions out of it now that you have six months in the area, if you had just let it ride a little bit longer, would you have been able to find something similar that would have been as good of a deal? Absolutely. There's good deals all over this town. So uh, I'm not going to say where I live just because I want to keep all the good deals for myself. So (laughs) (laughs) I am going on Facebook and looking it up right now. (laughs) (laughs) Does that imply that you are going to purchase more properties and and become a landlord? Is that is that your plan? Yes, I would absolutely love to buy more properties, even if this one started off a bit rough. I have learned a lot of lessons and I feel like the next one will go even better because I've learned so much. But I'm not going to buy another property until probably next spring. So probably for another six months or so. Is that to save up additional money? Is that to do more research? Why are you putting that arbitrary timeline? Like, is there, is there some takeaway? 
Yeah, I actually thought that I was going to buy another property uh, around this time. But then um, this house has required a lot more repairs than I thought. And I've sunk a lot of money into it. So I probably won't have enough money saved up to do a proper down payment until next spring. Gotcha. That makes sense. As as I see it from the, the conversation we've had, you are certainly maxing out your 401k, which is going, I assume, into whatever type of low cost index funds your company offers. Is most of your, I guess, taxable savings or your traditional savings going towards future down payments? Or are you doing other other things with your money as well? Uh, I'm maxing out my 401k, my HSA, and my Roth IRA while I'm trying to save up money for a down payment. Wow. Oh, that's that's fantastic. So you're really hitting both sides of this with the real estate, with the, the taxable savings, and then all you're maxing out all those different buckets. Yes. Yeah. And I could definitely speed up the whole down payment thing if I cut back on the taxable investments, but I'm not sure that I want to do that just based on how much longer it would take me to save up money. And I I don't want to give up that space in the taxable investment accounts because you only get it once. Right. So the the pre-tax, the 401k and HSA, right. And once you get past that calendar year or in in many cases, you get until April 15th of the following year to max it out. But once that deadline passes, you can never go back and put that money in. Right. With you doing all of that, it seems to me that your savings rate would be so much higher. Like if you don't have to pay for housing and you're doing everything that you're describing, I'm kind of surprised you're not over 50%. It- yeah, that's my, Jonathan, my exact thought. I was I was trying to do the math. I'm like, well, her living expenses are zero. She's maxing out all this stuff. Like how is her savings rate not 90%? So, so far I've spent, so let's see, I spent 5,200 on the first contractor that didn't work out. And then I had to spend an another $5,000 on this contractor and I still have more to go. So basically like I'm spending a ton of money on this house. So it's like extraordinary expenses for, but like if you didn't have that crap, like, and you did this, this house hack where your living expenses are zero. Cause like, yeah, my thought was that Delta of 1100 from what you were spending previously to zero. Now that's a huge amount, obviously like that should goose. If you're making in the seventies, like that in and of itself should raise your savings rate by 20%, right? Like if not more, since we counted after tax. Yeah. I mean, like sometimes I hit up to like uh, 70 or 80 percent savings rate, but it's offset by those negative 30 percent months, you know. Okay, so basically you're saying the theoretical math says I can hit 80 percent. But in reality, Murphy's law, what can go wrong does go wrong, especially when you're a landlord. That's just nailing you where your wallet is and it's it's dropping you back down. Exactly. Okay. All right. That makes sense. But um Frankly, the way I see it, Gwen, the with the moves that you've already made, you could go back to just being average for the next 30 or 40 years, and you are still going to be a multimillionaire. That's the power of just doing a few things right early on. But is there anything else that you want to hit us with, things that you've tried, things that you've optimized based on what you've read online, strategies that maybe you're contemplating or that you see yourself enacting over the next several years? Where do you go from here? Honestly, I am really, truly struggling to stay fully employed and I really want to be my own boss and go the kind of the entrepreneurial route. I have so many hobbies that I want to try and and get into, but I just don't have the time, especially now that I'm a landlord and working on my blog and working full time. I just I don't have that much mental energy. So I have started doing some hobbies. Uh, I quilt and I do stained glass and I would love to get into those more so I could potentially monetize that because there's definitely the potential to make some money there. But I just don't have any time to work on my skills yet. You know, what's so striking to me about that is that it so perfectly harmonizes with what we've just been talking about over and over and over again. It's that idea of creativity, flexibility, and ultimately what we're pursuing is trying to get time in our back pocket as a tool that we can use. Because if you have time and you're not operating from this scarcity mindset and you can invest in these hobbies and these side hustles and these projects without worrying about how you're going to put food on the table, it gives you the freedom to just go all in on it. And inevitably, when you're operating from a place of strength, the monetization comes to you. Yeah. And so I've been doing this all by myself. Uh, I've had boyfriends here and there, but uh, none of them panned out. But I am actually dating somebody now. So he lives uh, five hours away from me. And, you know, long distance is just a struggle. 
So there's like this clarion call. It's like, quit your job, move to Minnesota. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's rough to not just be like, okay, well, I'm done. Bye. And go up north. Yeah. It's kind of that, it's that F you money component that we talk about. If you were to be in a situation where you were to step away from your job, you would have years before you would have to go figure it out. Even if you didn't hit your fine number, just because of your incredibly high savings rate. Yeah, it gives me options, which I really appreciate. Um, if I wanted to be a stay-at-home parent in the future, I could totally do that. I wouldn't be dependent on my future husband for everything. I'd have my own money coming in. I'd have my own money to live off of should things go south. You know, it just gives me the freedom and the flexibility to do basically whatever we want in the future. So Gwen, you know that we did the episode a while back, episode 21, talking about the pillars of FI. But I'm just curious for you, thinking through some of those pillars of FI, which which other ones have you pulled that we haven't talked about yet? Maybe your car, cell phone, travel hacking, anything else really stand out to you? Yeah. So I kept the same car that I got as a junior in college and I have it to this day. It's a 2005 Pontiac Vibe. Nice. I don't know if I would call it an Econo, but certainly a hatchback. That's a nice ride. Yeah, it's uh, come very in handy. It fits eight feet boards, so I can definitely go up to Menards or Home Depot and pick up some lumber if I have a project. Solid choice. I remember looking for those for a while. They were very hard to find in the Virginia area at the time that I was looking for them use, but it was on my radar as one of these great options. They're still difficult to find since uh, they were one of the few hatchbacks that was actually being made in that time period. Oh, okay. Good to know. Well. Yeah. Uh, so then I also cut down my phone bill. I was paying $90 a month to Verizon for a grandfathered unlimited data plan, and they raised it to $120 a month. And I said, I'm out. I can't, I can't pay for that anymore. And so I went to Google Fi, and now I pay about um, 35 40 bucks a month. So you dropped the cell phone as well. You know, it's amazing to me. It is the little things, isn't it, Gwen? I mean, yes, absolutely. House hacking is huge. Not everybody's going to pull that lever. But it's consistently doing these and making these slightly more optimized choices over long stretches of time that add up to you being able to go into cruise control in your early 30s. Exactly. The little cuts here and there really add up after a while. So looking at the math, you're somewhere in the vicinity of 26 now. You've house hacked your way to having $0 of expense for housing every month. Your savings rate when you don't have some kind of crazy bill for your for your new house is somewhere in the vicinity of 70 plus percent. You've done every single thing right. Like where where do you go from here? What are your what are your plans for the future? Uh, I really want to focus on some entrepreneurial and creative endeavors in the future. I don't think that I'm long for the corporate world. It's a little stifling for personalities like mine. It is amazing how once you start to go down this rabbit hole and first you just, you start by just maybe just, some people may just get into it for frugality and then maybe they find Phi as a way of validating their prior choices. Other people have the light bulb and have this full awakening, but either way, once you're on the path and more options become available, there's a part of your personality that comes to life that maybe you had kept suppressed because it didn't serve you. Because when you're in the grind, the day-to-day grind, it doesn't help you to, to dream about the future. But when you start getting farther on this path and you realize that it is a possibility, you may actually be able to do this. The ideas start flowing and you can't turn it off. And then at some point, you're ready to give it a shot. And who knows what that looks like? I love that for you. It might be quilting. It might be stained glass. It might be podcasting, landlording, geo-arbitrage. Who the heck knows. There's so many different places you could land. The possibilities are endless. Oh, the places we will go. Now I'm excited (laughs) because where we're going next is the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Oh, I am so ready. Okay. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. I've listened to that like 30 times and it still gets me every time. I love it. It's just a beautiful thing. All right, Gwen, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. I would definitely go with Our Next Life. She's uh, very thought provoking and she, every article just makes me ponder it for a long time when usually I read an article and it's like, oh, that was cool. And then I go on, but hers makes stick in my mind. That's very cool. Yeah. I read their articles every now and again, but it's definitely a blog that's been on my radar that I need to just subscribe to once and for all. So yeah, I think that uh, definitely did it for me. I'm going to go subscribe after we finish recording here. I highly recommend it. 
All right. Uh, question number two, your favorite article of all time. I would go with the Mad Scientist guinea pig article. I'm actually in a race with Mr. Guinea Pig. Uh, he has this fictional guy and uh, it's what if your life is perfectly optimized, you don't have any crazy expenses, what would it look like? And we're definitely really close to each other. So that's exciting to see. You know, explain to me how the guinea pig works. Can we? Do we have time for that? Can you give me like the short summary? I am I am at the periphery aware that Mad Scientist does this guinea pig exercise, but describe how we set that up and what you're competing against. So the Mad Scientist has this series called The Guinea Pig, and he provides periodic updates. And he has one guy who is just doing the normal stuff, putting money into his taxable account. And then he has this other guy, this guinea pig, that is fully optimizing every opportunity possible, maxing out their 401k, HSA, you know, all that stuff. And I compare myself to the guinea pig and try and see if I can if I can beat that number. Unfortunately, uh, the guinea pig earns a bit more than me and doesn't have a house that uh, eats money like it's going out of style. So he's a bit ahead of me, but I will catch up eventually. <laughs> I will end you. That's not going to work. <laughs> I, no, I know the no, reference. I don't know the reference. It went over my head. Sorry. Okay. Millennial. Millennials, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Gwen, question number three, your favorite life hack. Definitely house hacking. Yeah, we certainly talked about that a lot today, so no, no need to expand on it. All right. Uh, question number four, your biggest financial mistake. Well, since they're pretty small in the grand scheme of thing, I'm going to include two. Uh, one was the including the 401k match in my first year that left $5,000 on the table that I could have put in there and I didn't. And then the second one was starting the search for an internship too late. So I missed out on that summer, whereas I could have been working and could have gotten a year's credit towards my service at this company. So kind of regret that I, I missed out on that. Now, is that service towards a pension or what is what does that mean? So at the company that I'm at, you get one year's worth of service credit towards your 401k and your pension vesting per year that you do as an intern. So I did one summer and that counted as one year. There were interns that I was with that had been there for three or four years because they went on through graduate school. And so by the time they came into the company as a full-time employee, their 401k was already in, already vested and they were very close to getting their pension vested, which do uh, which vest at three and five years respectively. All right. Question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. Don't wait. Just go out and do it. Don't sit on the sidelines and mull over things. Just do it and it'll work out. Nike's going to come after you for trademark <laughs> infringement. <laughs> Bring it. No. <laughs> but take action, right? I mean, that's cool, right, Brad? Yeah, I mean, that's what we always say here, right? It's just take action. Don't just be a passive observer to this podcast or the blogs you read. Like, actually put it into plan. I post this every single week in our Facebook group, which is what's the one thing you did this past week? that caused you to save money, save time, make your life easier, more optimized, healthier, et cetera. And I mean, we get hundreds of responses every single week, but it just starts with taking a little bit of action. So yeah, Gwen, I absolutely love that. Hey Gwen, we have a bonus question. So what was your favorite purchase made on amazon.com last year? Okay, so I have, again, two, cause they're just incomparable. Uh, one is called Cedar Side. And um, it's cedar oil in a spray, and it's a really good insecticide. So I used that in my war against ants this spring and was very victorious thanks to that. So definitely recommend that cedar side. And then um, another one is also a liquid, but this one is um, like an odor killing one. It's called Odoban, and uh, it really helped me when I was cleaning out my vacant unit across the hall when my tenant left me a gift of a raw T-bone steak in a cupboard in July for two weeks. <laughs> what a giver. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm uh, speechless. What, why on earth did they do that? Because uh, I, I ended his month-to-month -month lease and he didn't like it. <laughs> you ready to go get that next house? Sign me up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Gwen, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your time with us, sharing your story. I think there's like these little gems that we can extract from the decisions that you've made over the last five to 10 years. Uh, it, it really helped crystallize some concepts for me, but I know our audience is going to want to dig into your content. They're going to want to learn more about what you have done and what you will be doing. How can people connect with you? Yeah, they can find me on pretty much any social media channel. Uh, I'm on Twitter as at Fiery Millennial with no S. And then uh, my website is FieryMillennials.com and I'm also on Facebook. And 
I'm starting a podcast soon, which is called the Fire Drill Podcast. So look for that to be launching soon and get even more background and entertainment. Awesome. Now, do we have a launch date for that yet? Yes, it is going to launch any day. And we're really excited to uh, delve deeper into some stories and entertain as well as instruct. I am on the choose a five facebook group so i will for sure let everybody know when we launch it well thank you so much for sharing uh the fire is spreading my friends and we'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled you've been listening to choose fi radio podcast where we help middle class america build wealth one life hack at a time